Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. It was a fun evening. We had dinner at a nice restaurant, then decided to go down the stairs a bit and went dancing to a bar that none of us had ever been to. The Foggy Shore Bar. We both worked at a prestigious institution further from the city center. We heard that the drinks at the Foggy Shore were honest, the music was good, and the dance floor was big. I've never tired of spending time with her, and tonight was no exception. Actually, it was more fun than usual because she had been drinking. She rarely drinks more than two glasses in an evening, but today she drank four. I do not know what made me want to drink that night, but as I said, it was fun. She was a happy drunk, and I was curious to see how her intoxication would affect our bed that night. I was looking forward to the opportunity to find out. We both love dancing and have contributed. As usual, when we went out, she was accosted by several men who wanted to dance with her. And again, as usual, she turned them all down. When we left the bar, she was struggling with her coat, hit herself on the head with the purse she was holding in her hand, and tried to put that hand into the sleeve of the coat and got upset when it didn't fit. Then she stumbled out the door and fell into my arms. I caught her and she looked at me. She stumbled a couple more times, but we got to the car. You're my husband, right? What is it? She asked as I struggled to get her into the car. Yes, it is, I said laughing. I made love to Tyler Jones, she said and giggled. What did you say? I looked at her and she fainted. I took her home and put her to bed. Over the past three years, I have often undressed her and it never ceased to amaze me how beautiful her body was. She liked to sleep naked, so I left her like this. However, tonight was different. As I undressed her, I couldn't help but wonder if Tyler Jones, whoever he was, had undressed her and put his hands on her ass. I hardly slept that night, but she did. She didn't wake up until noon the next day. I just made myself another cup of coffee. In fact, brood is too strong a word. I put a small bag in the coffee maker, pressed the button, and the coffee filled my cup. Then I added some Bailey's liqueur to it and sat down at the kitchen table, sipping it. It was my fourth cup of the day. My usual limit is two. Lenny, short for Lenore, stumbled into the kitchen, still naked. She put her bag in the coffee maker, put the cup under the dispenser, and stood waiting for her cup to fill. When it happened, she picked it up, came over, and sat on the stool next to me. We sat lost in thought and drank coffee. I spoke first. Who is Tyler Jones? What? Who is Tyler Jones? Uh, I don't know. Are you sure? She just looked at me. Why do you ask? I took another sip of coffee before I spoke. Because last night, before you passed out, you told me that you made love to him. What am I? You told me you made love to him. Andy is my nickname. Andy, short for Andrew. I have no idea what you're talking about. I've known Lenny for almost four years. We've been married for the last three, well, almost three years. I was a bartender, and I still am, in fact. She was a waitress at the same establishment. I worked there for over a year before she started working. We tried to work the same shifts, but it didn't always work out that way. Sometimes I worked for days, and she worked for nights, and vice versa. Shortly after she started working there, she and I had our first date. Less than a month after that, we made love for the first time and have been making love at least four times a week ever since. I just looked at her. She spoke up. Damn it, I was drunk, and we've both seen enough drunks to know they can say anything. And most of what they say is true, I thought. We sat in silence, finishing our coffee. I'm going to get dressed, she said with an important look. Took both our cups and, as usual, washed them and put them in the sink to dry. In my mind, I saw Tyler Jones holding them in his hands and rocking them back and forth. We hardly spoke that day or that evening at work. Some people think that living and working together puts a lot of strain on a marriage, but in our case, it didn't seem to be the case. Still, the next two days were the same. At work, it seemed to me that Lenny was spending more time with some of his clients than necessary, but maybe it was my imagination. Finally, I said, Okay, I've had enough. I either want our lives back or this marriage is over. I agree, Lenny said. I'm tired of you looking at me like you're wondering when I'm going to take the next customer out to the backyard. So tell me what's on your mind. Good. In vino veritas. What? The truth lies in the wine. Almost every civilized culture in the world has a saying similar to this one, because they have all experienced the fact, Lenny, that you will hear the truth from the mouths of children and drunks. You said, 
I made love to Tyler Jones. You had no reason to say that, and I never assumed you'd been sleeping with anyone else since we got married. But it was clear as day from your drunken mouth. I made love to Tyler Jones. If it was before we got married, that's fine. If not, then we have a problem. Then we have a problem because I do not know why I said it or even if I said it. What do you mean if you said that? Of course you said that. Why would I take that name out of thin air and lie about something like that? Tell me why I should believe you, Andy. Obviously, you don't believe me, so it looks like we're in a stalemate, she said. Yes, I think it is. The stalemate continued for another week. We both had cars. The cars are an old model because we were saving up to buy a house, but I planned to surprise her with a new car for Christmas. That week, because of the impasse, we went to work separately. On Thursday, when I came to work, I kept waiting for her to show up, but another waiter was working at Lenny's usual tables. I called the night manager. Jill, why is Katie working at Lenny's tables? Because she called this morning and took the day off. She didn't tell me anything about it. I said, maybe you two should communicate better. We were busy and I couldn't call her, so I waited until everything calmed down. I took a break and called her. There is no answer. Go straight to voicemail. It was 9.30 in the evening and she wasn't answering her phone. I looked up and saw Jill heading in my direction. Jill, Lenny's not answering his phone. I think I'd better go home and find out what's going on. It's a good idea. She just called and quit. She said she wasn't coming back. I have to go. I dialed on the phone, taking my coat off the hook and buttoning it to protect myself from the cold air. She still didn't answer. I unlocked the door of our apartment and went in. She wasn't there. During a search of the apartment, it was discovered that part of her clothes and a makeup bag were missing. It was almost midnight when I called her parents. Have you heard from Lenny? I asked when her father answered. We have it. Where is she? Probably at Charlotte's, Andy. What's happening? I told him the short version. You two better pack up before it's too late. I called Charlotte. She and Lenny had been best friends since they were three years old. No one answered, so I left a message. Please ask Lenny to call me. Obviously, the stalemate had been overcome and she had taken the first step. I kept going over in my head what I could have done differently, and I always got the same result. Nothing. She got drunk and said what she said. I think I reacted the way an average husband would react. I lay down on our bed and tried to fall asleep. Unsuccessfully. I got up and tried to eat. Unsuccessfully. About the middle of the morning, I called her brother. I'm sorry, Andy. I called Charlotte again. Hi, Andy, she said. Do you have any news from Lenny? I have one. Do you know where she is? She's here with me. Can I talk to her? Not now. She's really angry and disappointed that you don't believe her. Believe her when? When she says she made love to him? Don't be an asshole. An asshole? What should I do? Tell me, what should I do? You can trust her. Damn it, I just asked you. Do I believe her when she admits it or denies it? You need to pull yourself together, Andy, or your marriage is over. Pull yourself together? She started it. She needs to prove to me that she didn't make love to this guy. How exactly will she do it? I don't know. Take a lie detector test. Swear on a stack of Bibles, on anything. I don't care how she does it. That's bullshit. Maybe you should prove that she did it. Innocent until proven guilty, right? But she damn well confessed. I told you to pull yourself together, Andy, or your marriage is over. She hung up the phone. Maybe you should prove that she did it. That's what Charlotte said. I called work at 11. Jill wasn't there, but the day manager was. I told him the story and told him I needed to get some rest. He had already heard some of this from Jill. What time is it? At least a week, maybe more. I have a lot to figure out. Well, you and Lenny were scheduled to be transferred back to work days next week, but we can get by for a while. Take two weeks. We'll count it off during your vacation. We'll find out more if you need it. I'll handle this with Jill. For the first two days when I was free, I struggled to make sense of my new world. I tried to call her several times, but to no avail. Maybe you should prove that she did it, I thought. I have developed a plan. It was a desperate plan, but it was a plan. I went to the library and looked through all the school yearbooks for the year we graduated from high school and for the two years before and after. I read every word on every page of every book, looking for any mention of anyone named Tyler Jones. It took me three whole days, but I found three of them. At home, I looked on the internet to see if their schools had reunion committees. They were. They also had biographies of everyone, where they are now and what they are doing. They even indicated the places of work of most of them. 
The first Tyler Jones worked in Washington, D.C., so it would be difficult to communicate with him. It followed from his biography that after graduating from high school, he enrolled at Ohio State University, and immediately after graduating from there, went to Washington for an internship with some member of Congress. The other two still lived next door. One was selling cars, and they called the dealership. As I understand it, some car salesmen, like some truck drivers, tend to wander around the city, never staying in one place for long. So I didn't know if he still worked at the same dealership listed in his biography. I was standing in the customer service area of a car dealership listed as Tyler Jones' place of work. One of the mechanics was passing by, and I asked him if Tyler Jones was still working there. He worked. Then I asked the same mechanic to point him out to me if he was nearby. He wasn't in the showroom. He was outside talking to a potential buyer. I thanked the mechanic and left. I knew I was taking a risk. But I left and came back shortly before they were supposed to close. I was lucky he was still there. When he left, I followed him. He stopped at a local bar near the car dealership and went inside. I waited a few minutes and followed him. There was an empty chair next to him and I sat down. As befits men in a bar, we got to talking. I'm Andy Buckles, I said, holding out my hand to shake his. I watched his face to see if I noticed any signs that he recognized the name. Tyler Jones, he said. We ended up spending a couple of hours chatting and buying each other drinks. This went on for two more evenings. We drank and chatted. This guy was courteous. I got the impression that he could talk anyone into anything. I bet he sold a lot of cars. He was funny, quick-witted, and handsome. I almost liked this guy. I decided that too many nights in a row might look weird, so I stopped for a while. I still had some free time, so I watched the third Tyler Jones. This guy was a TV news producer, but I couldn't get into the TV studio to see him. I made a copy of his prom photo and, like I did with another Tyler Jones, sat outside where he was working to see if I could spot him. It was only after 9 o'clock in the evening, on the second day of my viewing, that I recognized him. He gained about 45 kilograms, but nevertheless, it was him. There was a car waiting for him, and he got in, bent down and gave the driver a long, slow kiss. They broke off the kiss, then kissed again. Then the driver started to drive away. He turned his head to look over his shoulder at the movement. So let's get back to talking about the other Jones. During our conversations at the bar, I found out that he had been divorced for almost three years and had two children. The divorce was mainly his fault. He had a drinking problem and his wife got tired of it, so she kicked him out. He missed his children and did not see them often. He still drinks, but claims he hasn't been drunk since he got divorced. He came to the conclusion that he was drunk all the time because she drove him to it. She was hot. Look at all the people on Andy Griffith's TV show, he said. They were all happy except for one. Do you know why? They were all alone. The only unhappy one was Otis, and he was married, so he kept drinking. Sometimes I almost forgot who he was. His personality was charming. If he was telling any truth, he had more pussy than any five men I know. At least, according to him. But I still needed to find out. There was never any indication that she was unhappy with our lives or our routines. Of course, I was not unhappy with either of them. Of course, I knew that she was molested almost every day when she was working, but I never had any reason to think that she took it seriously or acted on it. I had enough free time and I was ready to come back. I called and was told that I was working the day shift and could come back the next day. I worked a full shift and it was nice to be back, although I found myself looking around trying to find Lenny waiting tables. I was still trying to talk to her, but to no avail. I began to wonder if she was doing anything to help save the marriage. I also wondered if she had dated other men. One evening I had a day off, so I sat down outside Charlotte's house and waited. Lenny and Charlotte got out, got into Lenny's car, and drove away. I followed them, but got caught in traffic and lost them. I went back to Charlotte's house and waited. They returned about three hours later, loaded with packages. I went out and approached them. Lenny. Lenny. We need to talk. The only thing I want to hear from you is an apology. Otherwise, stay away from me and stop harassing me or I'll get a restraining order. Lenny, please listen. I have a couple of options that we can talk about. No, you listen. Apologize or stay away from me. These are the only two options I'm interested in. With that, they entered the house. I got into my car and drove away. I was still working during the day and decided to come back and spend more evening time with Jones. He was there about twice as often as I was. I assumed that he came when he had no one to go to. It's been a few days since I last saw him and we greeted each other like old friends. 
One evening, we watched a couple come in. We watched because the woman was just amazing in every way. If there is an ideal figure, then she had it. If there is a perfect hairstyle, then she had it. If there is a perfect dress, then she was wearing it. Okay, she's almost wearing it. It showed her more than it hid her. Deep neckline in front and back. A really deep neckline. None of us said anything as we watched them approach the table and sit down. When she did, she crossed her legs, and the slit in her dress exposed her leg almost to her hips. Holy mother of God, Jones whispered faintly. Amen, I replied. I've had a lot of women, but damn it, she's probably the cutest creature I've ever seen. He called the bartender over. Who the hell is this? This is Mike and Vicky Hairston. He's one of those personal injury lawyers you see on TV. They come in here from time to time for a drink or two. He just likes to show it off to those of us in the unwashed crowd. I didn't pay any attention to him because of her, but now I've watched and really recognized him from the TV commercial. Jones spoke up. My ex-wife is no slouch, but I've never been so close to having something as enjoyable as this. He nodded in the direction of Vicky Hairston. It started a few months ago. What has started, I asked. Yes. I went into an institution I'd never been to before. My waitress was great. Not from the same class as that Vicky over there, but cool. My first time there was fine. We had a little chat with her, but nothing else. She was wearing an engagement ring, but that had never stopped me before. Many married women are looking for a strange man. Some of them don't even know about it, so I try to help them and convince them that every woman needs another man from time to time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I asked her if she was happily married. Of course, but it seems that we never do anything except work and return home. Sometimes we have dinner and dance. So sometimes when he works at night and I work during the day, I go out and have fun. Women who go to parties alone when their husbands are working are my favorites. It's just a matter of time and opportunity. He took a sip of his drink, then continued. When I was there for the fourth time, she agreed to meet for a drink. This drinking date led to other short dates. We had dinner a couple of times. We even went dancing. And when we were dancing, oh my God. At first it didn't happen, but later she rubbed her whole body against me, and when she felt my boner, she began to rub harder. And it was interesting because we were doing the same thing that she and her husband said they were doing, and she seemed completely satisfied. We have to be careful because of her husband, so we only see each other when they work different shifts. If he works during the day, we see each other then. One day, when he was working at night, this shit really got hot. I inhaled sharply. Lenny loved dancing, and we did it as often as we could. We even danced at work when there were no customers there. The rest of the staff was always watching and applauding. So what happened? I asked. At that moment, a couple of other bar patrons began to listen to him. He didn't try to keep his voice down and seemed glad to have an audience. He laughed. One evening we went dancing. I wanted to touch her firm buttocks and all the other parts of her body. She seemed a little friendlier. Asked her what? Is she ready to be used? What did she say? She stopped snuggling up to me and thought for a few seconds. I thought I had made a mistake. She looked at me and I saw that she had made a decision. She smiled. I thought you'd never ask, but we only have about three hours until my hubby gets home. Hubby? That's what Lenny called me. Hubby. This guy was a real salesman. I had a feeling that he could sell anything to anyone and that there was at least some truth in most of his pussy stories. I was starting to dislike him a lot. We almost ran to my car to get to my apartment, he continued. She stumbled up the stairs and I caught a glimpse of what was under her skirt. I liked what I saw and I reached out there. She was wearing panties and they were wet, man. I mean soaking wet. That's when I realized it was going to be a hot ass. She squealed, laughed, and scrambled up the stairs. Two other men and two women joined his audience. I could understand the men listening to him, but the women surprised me. When we went upstairs, we wasted no time undressing. When she was completely naked, she was standing there, and so was I. I was just watching. Every curve of her body was perfect. Her breasts, waist, and hips were perfectly proportioned. I was looking at her. One of the men nudged his companion. There is nothing new in this. We do this all the time. His companion just looked at him and rolled her eyes, as if to say, In your dreams. After a long time, she called a halt and said that she needed to rest. Me too. My tongue, neck, and back hurt. I brought us both drinks and we lay on the bed sipping them. It wasn't long before she bent down and started playing with herself. I was sweating too, but for a different reason. 
I looked around at the people who were listening to him. Two men were laughing and one couple was arguing. I heard a woman telling her companion that she could do the same thing that this fool can do, and the man suggested that they go try it. They ran out. One man came up and patted Jones on the back. Hey, dude, if you're still not making love to this chick, tell me her name. This caused a new explosion of laughter and arguments. The woman next to him hit him on the arm and said, Really? Well, you just gave it up, asshole. And she ran away with him after he tried to convince her that he was joking. Another guy asked where she worked. Nowhere now. She's on a break, Jones said. Will you take a break? Some guy shouted. Tell me where she is and I'll talk to her. Taking a break? Lenny, as far as I knew, was not working. Well, where is she? The other guy asked. He looked at his watch. She's with her best friend now. My stomach jumped into my throat. You said she was married. Where is her husband? I asked. Probably jerking off at home. A lot of laughter from his small audience. I wanted to leave, but at the same time I needed to stay. I took out my phone and called Charlotte. She answered and loud music started playing in the background. Hi, Andy. I can't talk right now. We're busy. In the background, I heard a voice that I could have sworn belonged to Lenny. Tell him I'm waiting for an apology. When she finished talking, there was laughter. Tyler Jones was a popular guy that night and spent more time talking about his exploits. He regaled his growing audience with stories of his victories. The men applauded and the women who were listening scolded him and called him a super student. The men wanted to believe him, but the women mostly laughed. He claimed that he stopped drinking after the divorce. In fact, his best friend started handing out stickers saying, I used Tyler Jones. These stickers were even on the walls of a couple of women's toilets in some of the less fashionable bars next door by the lake. This comment caught my attention. I excused myself and headed for the lake. I went straight to the foggy bank bar. It was the bar Lenny and I were in the night, she said. I made love to Tyler Jones. I sat down at the counter and, although I didn't need it, ordered a drink. It was late and the place was crowded. I continued to keep an eye on the toilets, especially the women's ones. There was a constant stream of people coming in and out. Finally, the place began to close. Drink up, Mac. It's time to go home, said the bartender. The same words that I have repeated many times. I hesitated before speaking. I have, uh, a rather strange request. What is it? I was talking to my friend. His name is Tyler Jones. He told me that there were... I made love to Tyler Jones stickers in the women's restrooms of bars all over the area. I don't believe him, so I was wondering if they were here and if I could see for myself. He started laughing. That asshole. His friend did it as a joke, and for a while these stickers were in fashion. Women who had never heard of him before came here and asked to give them to their girlfriends at wedding parties and shit like that. We still have some on the cubicle doors there. Come on, I'll show you. We went to the door of the women's bathroom, and he knocked to make sure no one was there. We went in, and of course there were stickers on each side of the doors on the four booths. I breathed a sigh of relief. If Lenny went to the bathroom drunk, sat in one of the cubicles, saw a sticker on the door, and then told me, I made love to Tyler Jones, she was just trying to tell me what she saw. It made sense to me. Lenny had been gone for over a month. It couldn't have been my Lenny. Jones might have been able to persuade people to buy cars, but to persuade a happily married wife to make love? Could he have done it? Could she have done it? Would she do that? It must be the stickers. She saw them and wanted to tell me about it. I started to feel good. I called Lenny, but she still wasn't answering. I called Charlotte. Just like the last time I called, loud music was playing in the background. What do you want, Andy? Her voice sounded a little drunk. I need to talk to Lenny. She's not here. Where is she? It's none of your business. Is she with someone? Uh, it's none of your business either. Please ask her to call me, Charlotte. Good. When I see her, I'll tell her. When will you see her? Probably not before tomorrow. Uh, later in the evening. Damn, I thought. I wonder if she's just pulling my chain. I hope that was the case. Listen, tell her that if she's interested in saving this marriage, she can go to the Foggy Shore Bar and use their bathroom for a few minutes. What? You heard me. I thought if she wanted to work on the marriage, she could go there that night. On the other hand, if she was with someone? It was almost noon the next day when my phone rang. It was Lenny. I didn't reply to it, but I read the message she left. I saw the stickers, 
I know what happened. Please call me. I turned it off and didn't turn it on anymore. She hasn't spoken to me in weeks, so now it's my turn. I knew she still had the key to our apartment, so that night I slept in the back of the bar. I ignored her calls like she ignored mine, but it hurt. I wanted to see her, hug her, and tell her that I love her, but I also wanted her to suffer a little. The next day, I was standing at the bar when I heard a familiar voice ordering drinks. I turned around and saw Lenny in her work uniform. I looked at her. She reached into her apron pocket, pulled out something, and attached it to her uniform shirt. I want to use Andy Buckles, the sticker read. She must have worked fast to write it in such a short time. She wore it for the rest of the night and listened to a lot of jeers, boos, and screams. We just smiled at each other at every opportunity. A lot of people, men and women, cheered me on. Go for it, Andy, or lucky bastard, or need help, Andy. More than one guy introduced himself to her as Andy Buckles. Towards the end of the evening, the crowd thinned out. Some of the staff started cleaning the place. Lenny and I locked eyes. I finished drying my hands with a bar towel, and we went to meet each other and met on the dance floor. Another couple was dancing. If you can call the contact of bodies a dance. I'm sorry, I said when we were only a few centimeters apart. I reached out and took the sticker off her apron, looked at it, smiled, and put it in my pocket. Me too. She said, do you want to dance? With pleasure. We danced for a couple of minutes. Her familiar curves and bulges felt good on my body, and I began to get excited for the first time since I saw Vicky Hairston. When are you going to fix this sticker? I asked, snuggling up to her. She cupped my face on both sides and kissed me, deeply and tenderly, all the while snuggling back. As soon as you take me home and undress me. Then I heard a familiar voice. Here she is. Here's my girl. And here's Andy. Are you trying to steal my girlfriend, Andy? Lenny and I split up and just looked at each other. Her eyes were huge. I take it you know him? I asked her. She didn't answer. Tyler Jones grabbed her, pulled her to him and kissed her. After the kiss, he held her at arm's length. I could see her eyes and they were full of panic and fear when she looked at me. How soon can you get out of here, baby? What is it? He asked softly, but still loud enough for me and the other people next to us to hear. She took a step towards me. Andy, me. I raised my hand to stop her. Then I spoke. Well, your wish has been fulfilled. What are you talking about? I took the sticker out of my pocket. You said you wanted to use me, and of course you did. I rolled the sticker into a small ball and threw it at her feet. I went back to the bar and started cleaning. Andy, you are welcome. What's going on? Tyler Jones asked, walking up to Lenny. Get away from me. She pushed him away and came over to me. Andy, it was only once. Please talk to me. What do you mean once? It's been at least six months. And why the fuck are you telling Andy this? Come on, let's go. Get off me. You didn't say that. I spoke up. So this is the waitress you told me about. That's her, buddy. Now she wants to act arrogant. I couldn't stop looking at Lenny. After Jones's last statement, she just collapsed on the floor, at the place where she and I worked. He walked over to her. Are you coming? She shook her head. Well, to hell with you. You can have her, Andy. She's good, but not that good. No, you take it. I don't need her anymore. More? Yes, more than three years. She's my wife, but not for long. Your wife? Holy shit. I've never seen anyone move so fast in my life. I shouted after him. Hey, come back and get her. She's yours now. I don't want her. Jill, the night manager, came up to her. I think you should leave. And he gestured for two other employees to escort her out. My mind was filled with visions of my wife and Jones, but at the same time it was devoid of thoughts, if that makes any sense. I was cleaning the bar robotically, trying to cope with my emotions and worries. Jill came up to me. Go home. Get some rest. Call me when you're ready to come back. I did as he suggested. I went home. When I went inside, I made sure I bolted the door. She wasn't going to come in for her stuff until I was ready. Less than an hour later, I heard her turn the key in the lock. Then I heard a knock. Andy? Andy? Let me in, please, Andy. Go away, you don't live here anymore. Andy, please let me at least get some of my stuff. Why? You took your makeup when you left and they don't need any clothes, so everything's ready. I'm not like that. Oh, that's right. You were doing this for fun with someone other than your husband. Her voice got louder. Go away, you can pick up your stuff tomorrow.
Be here at nine, because by ten, all that's left of you will be in the dumpster. Andy, please, get your cheating ass out of here. The knock came shortly before nine the next morning. I looked through the small glass in the door. I didn't see Lenny, but I saw Charlotte. I opened the door. What do you need? I came to pick up Lenny's things. I pointed to several trash bags that I had filled with her stuff. Here they are. She can choose the furniture as she pleases, or she will be removed from here in an hour. She can't do that. Why not? She's sick. Is she ill? What is her problem? Is Peter missing? Come on, Andy. She drank a whole bottle of vodka last night, and she's in bad shape. Is she in bad shape? How do I look, Charlotte? And you, her best friend. You helped her sleep with you. For what? For whom? A smooth-talking scumbag who described in detail to the audience how he used her? Then he comes to her place of work and declares in the presence of her husband and about a dozen other witnesses that he needs her. Yes, she's really sick. And you too. Now take her shit and get out. She started carrying the bags to the door. And you can tell her that I want my grandmother's ring back. Three days later, half of our furniture was gone. Everything she liked, including our bed, I put on the side of the road so that everyone could pick it up. I had no idea if she was making love to Jones or someone else on the bed, so I got rid of it. Then there was a knock on the door. I looked back, and it was Lenny. I let her in. What's wrong with you? What is it? She asked. People are taking my furniture down there. It's not your furniture. You left this apartment, abandoning me and the furniture so you no longer have rights to it. And give me my grandmother's ring. You gave it to me. It's mine. Give it to me or I'll rip off your fucking finger and take it. It is intended for the woman who will forever be my wife. She started backing towards the door and pulling off the ring at the same time. I would never hurt her, but I was angry. She took it off and threw it on the floor. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. I thought we could talk about everything, she said. No way in the world. Go talk to Tyler Jones. He's a good conversationalist. He talked you into sleeping with him. Is he the only one who could talk you into cheating? Or were there others? Now she stood with her back to the door and slid down until she was on the floor. And tears began to flow. I just wanted to have some fun, Andy. He came up to the bar and talked to me. You were there the first couple of times, but there were so many visitors that you didn't notice it. After several visits, he offered to buy me a drink elsewhere. You worked nights, and I met him. Are you saying that anyone who gets close enough to you to make love to you? No, but... Who are you? What happened to my wife? Charlotte told me. Oh, it doesn't matter. Did Charlotte say what? Every time we meet, she tries to persuade me. She says you're an asshole and you don't want me to have fun. She's my best friend. She takes care of me. Taking care of you used to be my job. How many guys did she set you up with? I assume you picked up Jones yourself. Andy. How many guys did she set you up with? Please. Two? Five? Ten? More than ten? Me. Forget about it. I don't want to know. You need to leave. She slowly got to her feet. Can I at least walk around and see if there's anything else of mine in there? I can assure you, there is nothing of yours in this apartment. What about the ownership of my car? It's in one of the bags that Charlotte took. Along with your photos, except for our wedding album, I threw it away. She was standing in front of the door. I pulled it away, opened it, and pointed to the exit. She looked at me. Andy, please, get out. Her head was down and she was crying when she entered the hall. I closed the door to our marriage. I went back to work. It was hard to look at the dance floor where our fight took place. Jill, the night manager, was sitting at the bar. I gave him a glass of ice water. You know, Andy, we own a bar and restaurant at the Capitol International Hotel downtown. It's called Oriskany. There is also live piano music every evening, and there is a small dance floor. If you want, we can transfer you there. It's more upscale than here, and the pay is better. Besides, it will allow you to leave here. Three days later, I was at my new bar. I met with the day manager, and she introduced me to the staff before we opened for the day. I had to start working for a few days. The days meant that we went there at 10 a.m., prepared the room, opened the doors at 11, and worked until 7 p.m. The night shift started at 7 and worked until closing, which was usually at 2 a.m., but sometimes lasted a little longer. The International Hotel was very upscale, and I loved being there. The day before I started my new job, I initiated the divorce process and decided to stop shaving and grow a beard. Lenny and I didn't have much. In fact, when I went online to check our bank account, more than half of the money was gone. 
Lenny got advice from someone, probably from Charlotte. Oh, well, the court would have given it to her anyway. Then I did the usual things like a credit card. I say map because we only had one. I canceled it and applied for a new account. Until I received the card, I could only use cash. The phones were registered in her name, so I opened my account for that too. She was served at Charlotte's. I have no idea how she reacted. One day it dawned on me that Jones said he had used Lenny at least six times. I needed to see a doctor. I didn't have any symptoms, but at that time I had no idea what symptoms sexually transmitted diseases have and what their incubation period is. The results sucked. Gonorrhea. Fucking syphilis. I wanted to kill her. I've already said that I would never hurt her, but when I heard that I had syphilis, all bets were off. I could have easily strangled her, not to mention that bastard Jones. I could never blame a man or a woman. But actively looking for married women or men is absolutely reprehensible. To do this, you need to be a certain type of garbage. And then being so careless as to infect them was beyond praise. I started calling Lenny and telling her how I felt about her getting syphilis, but why bother? A few days later, her brother knocked on my door. I have just returned from vaccinations against sexually transmitted diseases. I let him in. You cheated on my sister and now she has one of these things. I have to kill you. There was murder in his eyes and he scared the shit out of me. Hey, tiger, I said, stepping away from him. If you're talking about sexually transmitted diseases, then the opposite is true. Your sister cheated on me with at least one guy. She infected me. That's a lie. She said you'd say that. I'm going to kick your ass. He started walking towards me and I started backing away again, but there really was nowhere to go. Well, I said as calmly as I could, before you do that, there are a dozen or more witnesses who heard the man say he used her at least six times, and she didn't deny it. Then she told me that she did it for fun. For fun, Jimmy, that's his name. She cheated on me with a worthless for fun. And Charlotte helped her. I helped her, damn it. I encouraged her. He looked like he had calmed down. Jimmy had some problems in his life. He had served time in prison for assault, so I knew he wouldn't hesitate to beat me half to death. I know you have no reason to believe me and not your sister, but you know me. And you know that I'm not a liar, and I'm certainly not a traitor. The guy you need to talk to is Tyler Jones, I told him where Jones worked. And if you have any influence over your sister, you're going to try to get her away from Charlotte. I've been trying for years, but she wouldn't listen to me. He looked at me intently, not wanting to believe me, but after a few seconds he turned and left. Four days later, I read in a newspaper left on the bar that a potential car buyer was conducting a test drive of a new car from a local dealership. He was accompanied by salesman Tyler Jones. The potential buyer stopped the car, saying that he heard a noise. Both he and Jones got out of the car, where he beat Jones almost to death. He left Jones on the side of the road and returned the car to the dealership. The news report said Jones would most likely lose his testicles, but he would probably never have a problem with hemorrhoids, because the tire iron that was found sticking out of his ass would take care of it. The article never said it in exact words, but there was certainly a subtext. The newspaper quoted a police statement. Mr. Jones was a local Casanova who was known to be responsible for several marriage breakups over the past couple of years. Blood tests showed that he had several different sexually transmitted diseases, among which were syphilis and gonorrhea. Keep it up, Jimmy, and whoever infected Jones with these diseases, I thought, reading the article and laughing. I wondered how many of them Lenny had. The same newspaper reported that the trailer belonging to Miss Charlotte Williams was completely destroyed by fire. The trailer was not insured and became a total loss. One of these days, I'm going to have a serious conversation with Jimmy about his anger management issues. Then I'll buy him a couple of drinks. I had a fleeting thought about where Charlotte would live now, and whether Lenny was going to move in with her. Then I realized that I didn't care. I expected the police to question Jones and I was questioned, but nothing came of it. I got the impression that finding the person who beat him up was about the same priority as chasing pedestrians on the street. As time went on, I liked my new haircut more and more. I also liked my new beard. At first I tousled it a little, but decided to cut it. After I did this, I received a lot of comments from my clients. I also liked the fact that my divorce was finalized. Obviously, when Lenny received the papers, she signed them and sent them back. She didn't bother to appear in court the day the case came before the judge. My antibiotic shots did their job and I was declared disease-free. But communication never seemed to appear on my radar screen. It was also time for my lease to expire. So I found an apartment closer to work. 
I didn't replace most of the furniture I threw away, but I bought a new bed. My new apartment was so small that the king-size bed took up most of the bedroom, and it was difficult to move it up three flights of stairs. Fortunately, I had friends who helped me. We've been friends with one of them, Georgie Patterson, for a long time. We grew up in the same neighborhood. So did Lenny, Charlotte, and a few other friends. When I called and asked if he could help me with the move, he showed up with his friend. Bryce, that was his name, and when Georgie introduced us, Bryce said, Andy Buckles, are you Andy Buckles? Me. Holy shit, I know your wife. My ex-wife, I corrected him. Did you use it too? I, hell no, but I'm married to Charlotte's cousin, and of course I've heard your name mentioned. He didn't like Charlotte very much, and he started to fill me in on the events around her. He told me that after Charlotte's trailer burned down, he and Lenny rented a furnished house in the same trailer park. He told me that the couple of times he was in Charlotte and Lenny's company together, Lenny was inconsistent in her comments about me. When she was sober, I was a complete jerk. But when she drank a little, there were a lot of tears and thoughts about how to get me back. Charlotte kept telling her that I didn't deserve her. But again, it was when she was drunk that Lenny defended me and admitted that it was all her fault. Another tidbit he shared was that both Lenny and Charlotte blamed me for what happened to Jones. I asked him if Jones had visited them yet. Nope, he said. I think he called Lenny a couple of times before he got his ass kicked, but she wasn't interested. He also told me that Lenny worked as a waitress and gave me the name of the place. On my next day off, I went there. I went in, looked around, and saw that she was waiting tables. With my new beard, I thought she wouldn't recognize me. She moved from table to table as efficiently as ever and joked openly with her customers. Twice I saw her pull her hands away from her ass, something she had to do almost all her life as a waitress in a bar. I could also see and hear her joking with them while either she or they were talking. But the minute she turned away from them, the smile disappeared and a slight sadness appeared on her face. The smile returned the second she started chatting with another customer. I had no idea why I was there and watching her, so I left. I was working the night shift when Lenny came in and she was with a man. She looked like she had lost a few pounds. As far as I knew, she had no idea that I worked there. I took a piece of paper from under the counter and wrote a note. I do not know if you know, but the woman you are with cheated on her husband and gave him a venereal disease. Act at your own risk. From time to time, I would come out from behind the counter and head to where I could see the dining area of the restaurant. In the break between the salad and the first course, I saw that Lenny excused herself and went to the ladies' room. I folded my note and went over to their table. I'm sorry, sir, I said, but someone gave me this to give to you. I handed him the note. By the time I got back to the bar, he was already leaving the restaurant. I went back to where I could see their table. I watched as Lenny sat down and took the note that her date had placed so she could see it. She seemed to read it, crumpled it up, got up and left. She walked three meters away from me and didn't recognize me, but I could see tears in her eyes. Their waitress was standing at their table with their entrees, not knowing what to do with them. I went up to her. They're both gone, but I know where you can send their bill. Part of me enjoyed writing the note and seeing the results, but another part thought it was a cheap trick that only an asshole could do. I didn't think I'd ever do it again. Once was enough. The call came two days later. It was Lenny. I know it was you. Do you know who I was? You sent a note. I lied. I have no idea what you're talking about. It should be you. What the hell are you talking about? Every time I get a new job, someone calls and says that I have sexually transmitted diseases and I get fired. When I meet a guy, someone tells him that I'm a cheater and I have sexually transmitted diseases. What exactly does this have to do with me? It's you. I know it's you. I know you hate me, but please, I'm begging you. Please stop this. I have to work. I need a job. Please, Andy. Why do you think it's me? I haven't talked to you, so I have no idea where you work. So you're barking up the wrong tree. It's probably Tyler. He said you were the best he'd ever had, which makes me think he didn't have much, because as far as I understood, you were always kind of mediocre. No, I'm not making love to him, and that's also because of you. Did she say that she would have made love to him anyway if he had been able to? Did I cause what? You beat him up, and now he'll never be able to make love again. Oh, that's too bad, I said with all the sarcasm I could muster. Maybe you can find someone else to infect you with diseases or you can infect them like you infected me. Fuck you. And she hung up the phone. I laughed. I did send one note to her dinner companion, but I didn't send the others. 
Maybe it was Jones. Maybe he was taking revenge, but I would have thought that he would most likely have tried to take revenge on the person who beat him up. And if I were in his place, I would have thought that it was me, not her. Then I thought about what I had just said to her. Up to this point, I hadn't made any attempts to set up a date or even talk to any woman. But suddenly the time came. Three days later, a couple came. They were well-dressed like professionals. They had dinner at a restaurant, then went to a bar to have a drink and listen to music. Their waitress brought them their first drinks while the woman was in the ladies' room. I watched as the man added something to her drink, then picked it up and turned it over in his hands. I went over to the table. I'm sorry, but I mixed the wrong drinks. This is my mistake, so I will replace them. I took both glasses, carried them behind the counter, and set them aside. I mixed two identical drinks and waited for the woman to return before serving them. Then I called the manager over and told her what I had done. She called the police. The couple finished their drinks, and the man ordered another one. Two policemen entered through the back door and went straight to the manager's office. The manager pointed one of our surveillance cameras directly at this table. I personally delivered the drinks. After a couple of minutes, the woman approached the pianist and made a request. The camera recorded how the man threw something into the woman's drink while she was talking to the pianist. As soon as it got into the glass, two policemen came out and took him to the office. They also took the drink that I put behind the counter. They asked the lady to follow them to the manager's office. Then they all went out the back door. Two days later, I was ready to get to work. It was just before seven in the evening. I was in the staff locker room, putting on my official work shirt, bow tie, and vest, when the manager told me that someone was waiting for me. She was sitting alone at the far end of the bar. She had been there since 5 p.m. and was drinking iced tea. He said, Oh, great, I thought. Lenny's back. I went out and stood behind the counter. The day shift bartender patted me on the shoulder and jerked his head in the direction of the woman. I looked, and it wasn't Lenny. I didn't know who she was. I took a towel from the bar, wiped my hands, slung it over my shoulder where I usually keep it, and walked over to her. Hi, I said as casually as I could. I understand you've been waiting for me. She smiled. Yes, it is. My name is Dana Alexander, and I know I have to thank you. For what? For saving me from a scumbag who tried to give me Rohypnol? Not once, but twice. Oh, I didn't recognize you. Are you okay? Yes, thanks to you. If it wasn't for you, I'd be in real trouble. It didn't mean anything. Bastard. Uh, uh, such people should be in prison. Well, he is like that. Or was until he was released on bail. I'm guessing your husband wouldn't need a date rape drug, so he must be a boyfriend. God, no, she said. He's a colleague. Or was. He was fired when the company found out what he had done. Have you two been dating for a long time? No, it was the first time. He was such a nice guy at work. He was hired six months ago, but he only started hitting on me two weeks ago. I have a rule that I never meet with colleagues, but he exhausted me. Did you have any indication that he was going to try to drug you with illegal substances? No. The dinner was wonderful and he behaved like a real gentleman. He was the same as in the office, cheerful and intelligent. Not to mention, I thought he looked really good. Well, it's over now. Not really, she said. We still have to meet him in court. We? She laughed. Yes, we are. You can be sure that you will be called as a witness. I hadn't thought of that. It's not a big deal. The chance to put such an asshole in jail is not a problem for me. Dana Alexander sat in the bar for a long time before leaving, and we talked at every opportunity between the customers. I discovered that she and the asshole who tried to drug her were both architects. If I could go to college, that's what I'd like to be. She thanked me again and said goodbye saying that I would see you again. A couple of days after that, an employee of the district attorney's office visited me. He wanted to discuss my appearance at that asshole's trial. Over the next few weeks, I had several meetings with him and other employees of the district attorney's office. I never saw Dana Alexander. Meanwhile, I met a couple of women who became regular partners for me. I enjoyed the company of both of them for about three months. There were no claims of exclusivity. If I spent the night with one, the other was fine with it because she knew that the next night belonged to her. One evening, they were sitting together in a bar when a woman and two men came in. The three of them sat down at a table and drank and danced for a couple of hours. They were free in their feelings because she kissed them both equally. My two girls, Judy and Anna, danced their share of the dances when they were asked. 
In between the dances, a lot of our attention was focused on the trio. It was Judy who first mentioned the old movie Paint Your Van, in which a woman had two husbands, so she didn't see anything wrong with what the three of them were doing. Anna then suggested that it would be fun to have two men at the same time. How about this, Andy? Would you agree to a threesome? Judy asked me. I laughed. It depends on whether the three of us will be together, I said and walked away to serve a customer. When I returned to the girls, they were whispering. They stopped when I approached. What do you mean? Anna asked. Well, participating in a threesome boy-boy-girl is not on my wish list. However, just at that moment I went away to help another client and stayed to chat with him for a couple of minutes. Judy interrupted us by banging her glass on the counter. How about a little service here? She said, laughing. I grinned, took the towel off my shoulder, and walked slowly back to them, wiping the counter as I went. They were sitting on their bar stools when I left, but now they were both leaning over the counter, trying to get as close to me as possible. As soon as I got to them, Judy whispered, However what? I grinned again and leaned closer to both of them. Nevertheless, I do not know of any pure-blooded man who would refuse the opportunity to make love in a threesome with two women, I whispered back. They looked at me, then at each other, then leaned back in their chairs together. Girls, would you like another drink? I'm buying, I said. They refused, saying they needed to leave. I was busy for the rest of my shift. It was already three o'clock in the morning when I returned home. I took a shower and, still drying myself, went to my bedroom and went to bed. I had just thrown the towel on the floor and was about to jump into bed when someone knocked on my door. I took a towel, wrapped it around my waist, and opened the door. We brought something to eat, Anna said, walking past me with Judy right behind her. They've both been to my apartment before and actually spent the night on different occasions. Yes, we thought you might be hungry, Judy giggled. I looked from one to the other and they seemed hot, steaming. Where's the food? Who said anything about food? Anna asked. You said so. No, I said we'd brought something to eat. There is a difference. Yes, Judy said, starting to unbutton her blouse. She was unbuttoned and she wasn't wearing a bra. Hey, this is convenient, Anna laughed and pointed at my towel. It looks like he was waiting for us, Judy said. Anna brought her lips as close to mine as she could without actually touching them, and sighed rather than spoke. Is that all, Andy? Have you been waiting for us? Then she kissed me, at the same time reaching down to loosen my towel and let it fall to the floor. My knees buckled. Judy stood on one side of me and Anna on the other. They took my hands and led me backwards into my bedroom. I felt my feet hit the edge of the bed and they pushed me back to where I was sitting. Judy finished taking off her blouse. Anna was wearing a shirt and she pulled it over her head. She was also braless. My gaze darted from one pair of boobs to the other. Judy held out her hand. We didn't bring any food but you can eat it. And this, Anna added, placing her hands on the sides of her breasts and rocking them back and forth. Oh, look, Judy said. He's glad to see us. She pushed me back so that my feet were still on the floor, but my back was on the bed. She unbuttoned her jeans and took them off along with her panties at the same time, while Anna did the same. The rest of the night was an absolute paradise. The double bed, which I thought was too big, turned out to be perfect. The three of us have been together for about three months, but then Judy went on a cruise with some of her sorority sisters and came back smitten by one of the ship's junior officers. Anna, on the other hand, got a promotion in her company and was transferred to Phoenix. I was going to miss them, but at the same time I breathed a sigh of relief. I needed to get some rest. The girls and I had been together for a couple of months when the trial of the guy who tried to rape on a date began. I came forward as a witness for the prosecution and that bastard got five years in prison. I was hoping his cellmate was a big bastard. The trial lasted only one day. I saw Dana Alexander there, and we had a short conversation. One evening, Bryce walked into a bar. He laughed and told me that Lenny and Charlotte's friendship was over. One evening, they both got drunk and started arguing. Lenny accused Charlotte of leading her into temptation and causing the divorce. Charlotte eventually left in a drunken stupor got into her car and less than a block from home crashed into another car, broke through a fence and crashed into a house. She crashed her uninsured car. Obviously, she didn't like the insurance because her trailer was uninsured too. She was sentenced to six months in prison for drunk driving, driving without insurance and leaving the scene of an accident. She also lost her license for a year. 
I told Bryce that I was no longer interested in hearing about Lenny or Charlotte, and that I considered this part of my life closed. I was promoted to day manager at work, so I no longer work at night, except when it is necessary to replace the night manager when she has a day off. She did the same for me. One Wednesday evening, we had a particularly busy crowd, so we were extremely busy. We like to be busy in the restaurant and bar business. This means that people eat and drink. I was sitting at the far end of the bar with a glass of iced water when I felt a touch on my shoulder. I turned around and saw Dana Alexander. I stood up and turned to her. Good evening, I said. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And you? Pretty good, thanks. What can I do for you? Nothing. Truth. We just stopped by for dinner and I thought I'd say hello. Good. Enjoy. I watched as she joined the couple and the three of them entered the restaurant. Later in the evening, I helped a woman take her husband out the door and into a taxi after he had drunk too much. I made a note to remind myself to talk to our waiters about looking after our guests. I watched the taxi drive away, turned to go back inside and almost collided with Dana. I've been looking for you, she said. I'm here. I can see that. Still looking out for people, I see. It's just part of the job, I said in an exaggerated Texas accent. Look, I don't want to be annoying, and to be honest, I've never done this before. But would you be interested in having a drink with me sometime? She added quickly. As a thank you. I just looked at her. Of all the things I could have expected, Dana Alexander's date invitation never came to my attention. Uh, I'm sorry. I've put you in an awkward position. You're either married or in a relationship. So, please excuse me. She was about to leave. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I grabbed her arm and turned her to face me. I'm not married and I don't have a relationship. It's just that no beautiful woman has ever asked me out before and I was... In fact, I'm still in shock. I'd love to have a drink with you, she smiled. Great. How about Friday? Or are you working? Friday will be perfect. What time and where should I pick you up? Well, since I asked you, I'll pick you up at 7. Just tell me where to go. I gave her my address. I was ready at 7 when she arrived. I had no idea what to wear, and for the first time in my life, I understood how a woman feels on a first date. I settled on slacks and a sports jacket with a tie. Do you mind if we move on from drinks to dinner? What is it? she asked. I missed lunch today. Not at all. That was my answer. We went to a very nice restaurant, had dinner, danced, and she drove me home. When we got there, she got out of the car as if she was going to walk me to the door. I decided that thank you had gone far enough, so I told her that she didn't need to walk me to the door. How else can I kiss you goodnight? What is it? she asked. I walked around to her side of the car. I can fix it, I told her. I hugged her. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Then I kissed her. Not on the cheek, but right on the lips. She got into her car and drove away. I literally flew up the stairs to my apartment, wondering how I was so lucky. However, my good mood was short-lived when I realized that I had not received her phone number. As I usually do when I undress, I turned out all the pockets, including the pockets of my jacket. I reached into the left pocket of my jacket and pulled out a business card. It was Dana's business card, and on the back she wrote her mobile number. She must have slipped it in there during one of our dances. It was a business card, so it had the name and address of her company on it. I didn't call her over the weekend, but on Monday morning I ordered two dozen roses to deliver to her office. At one o'clock in the afternoon, I answered the phone at the bar. Oriskany, can I help you? Not the loudest name in the world, but it was one of the best and most popular night spots in the city. The man who first opened the establishment served aboard the USS Oriskany during World War II, so he named his establishment after the ship. There was even a large model ship behind the counter. Is that Andy? That's right. Hello, this is Dana. I just got some beautiful roses. Thanks. You're welcome, my lady. There was a slight pause before I spoke again. I was going to call you later to see if you'd like to have dinner with me again. I would like that. When did you mean that? Well, today is Monday and Friday is usually a big date, so how about tomorrow? She laughed. I do not know where you developed your logic, but tomorrow sounds great. She gave me her address and I asked her if it would be convenient by seven. It was a very nice house, in a very nice area. And we had another very pleasant evening. For the next few weeks, we met at least three times a week. I found out that she got divorced after five years of marriage because they just fell out of love with each other. They were still good friends. In fact, 
She said they were better friends now than when they were married, and now he was living on the West Coast. The house she lived in was their home, and she got it in the divorce. I almost felt sorry for the poor guy paying off the mortgage on a beautiful house he couldn't live in. I felt even worse when Dana and I made love for the first time in this house, on their bed, and we took a shower together in the same shower she shared with him. We were happy for about six months. We laughed, joked, and met quite often, and every time we went out, I was grateful that I worked all day, except, as I said, when the night manager was free. As usual, I called her to find out when she would like to go out again. I'm sorry, Andy, but my ex is in town and I'm going to have dinner with him. Uh, okay, sure, have fun, I stammered. My first thought was that she told me that they had just fallen out of love with each other and they are better friends now than when we were married. I waited two days before calling her again. Andy, Cliff, that's her ex's name. We're still here and we're chatting about some things. And besides, my firm has a deadline for the completion of a new building that we are designing, and I have to check some numbers. I was in a difficult position. I had no reason to believe that she and Cliff were sleeping together, but I also had no reason to believe that Lenny was cheating. The difference was that Lenny and I were married, but Dana and I weren't. I didn't have to like it, but she was free to sleep with whoever she wanted. And yet part of me wanted to know the truth. Part of me wanted to ask her, but the rest of me didn't want to know if she'd slept with him. I called her and the call went straight to voicemail. I called her office. I'm sorry, but Miss Alexander is unavailable. Would you like to leave a message? No, there are no messages. A week has passed. I was in my manager's office when I called her again. She replied, Hello, how are you? Well, we haven't talked for over a week and I just thought, Oh, Andy, I've been so busy. Let me ask you a question. Of course. Is Cliff still in town? Why are you asking about this? Is he... Why are you worried about him? Then I just blurted it out. Are you sleeping with him? I asked. The next thing I heard was silence when she ended the conversation. That pretty much told me what I needed to know. I went back to the restaurant and the kitchen to check on how things were going. I sulked until the end of my shift when I got home. As usual, I turned out my pockets, undressed, and went to the shower. After the shower, I put on a bathrobe poured myself a gin and tonic and sat down to watch the news. I sat down in my deep armchair, leaned back, pressed the on button on the remote control and took a sip of my drink. Before I could do that, someone hammered on my door with such force that it seemed like it was flying off its hinges. I got up, put down my glass and opened the door. Miss Dana Alexander burst into the room and started. You're a jerk. You're an insensitive jerk. I'm a free woman over the age of 21, and damn it, I can do whatever I want. No insecure jerk is going to change that, just like it's your right to do the same thing. I raised my hand and interrupted her. Wait a minute. Let's get one thing straight. She just stood there and looked at me. What are you talking about? You just said that I have the right to make love to your ex, husband and 20 others, and I told you that I don't want that. That's not what I said. That's exactly what you said. Well, that's not what I meant. Oh? Okay, then continue your tirade. She took a deep breath. The point is you can't tell me who to sleep with, just like I can't tell you who to sleep with. I didn't want to sleep with anyone but you. Didn't you want to? What do you mean I didn't want to? Don't you want to now? Not if you slept with your ex-husband and 20 others. Damn it, I'm not going to sleep with anyone but you. That's what I was trying to tell you. Then where have you been for more than a week? I was working. Our construction plans are behind schedule and we will be fined if we do not make it in time. You didn't have time for me, but did you have time for Cliff? We were working on a deal to buy my house. He's getting married again and can't afford to pay for two houses, so he wanted to know if I'd take over the payments and buy it. I didn't have to do it because the divorce gave me the right to do it, but I saw no reason to keep harassing him, and I can afford it, so we made a deal where I would pay off the mortgage and he would contribute a certain amount every month until it was paid. Everything is quite civilized. As I told you, he and I are still friends. We just fell out of love with each other. Where is he staying? With you. Are you going to be this jealous for the rest of our lives? Yes, where is he staying? With my sister about four kilometers from my house. And you've never slept with him? That's a stupid question. Of course I slept with him. He was my husband. She gave me back some of my sarcasm. I mean, while he was here this time. 
Aren't you listening? No, I didn't sleep with him. What about 20 other guys? You idiot. Pour me a drink, then undress, and I'll show you who I'm making love to. End.